Stan, and on behalf of the Board of Directors of the Blair County Sports Hall of Fame, we want to say thank you to everyone here tonight. It's a great evening, and we're very proud of the fact that we now have our largest crowd ever for a Blair County Sports Hall of Fame dinner with over 700 people comfortably fitted into the casino here. Uh, it, we know we made it a little difficult for people to get to the restroom tonight, but uh, really, uh, we cannot do this without the great support that we have here from the people of Blair County and surrounding communities. Uh, we're very proud of the way this area supports this dinner every year. We could not put on the kind of dinner that we do here without your support. And I just want to say on behalf of everybody in our committee that we really want to thank you for that great support. Um, many years ago, I think it was about 1986, when Neil Rudell came up to me and we went, and the first time and the only time that Neil ever bought lunch for me, so I knew there was something wrong. And when we went out to the old keg and butcher block on Route 220, and uh, Neil said, I got this idea. And I, you know, Neil always has lots of ideas, as you know, read in the sports pages. But this was one idea that I thought actually made some sense. And uh, when Neil said, I think we ought to look at doing a Blair County Sports Hall of Fame, uh, we jumped on it. And Steve Sheets and Bernie Denver and myself with Neil uh, were the original committee and original officers, and uh, we're still there and kicking. And, uh, one of our dreams uh, when we started off on our first dinner was that we would sometime be able to house the memorabilia of all our various inductees. And fortunately, I, I'm pleased to report this year that just this past week, we opened our fir first memorabilia uh, display at the Summit Tennis and Athletic Club. We want to thank the Summit for their great cooperation. They've invited the public at any time to come in and view the memorabilia on the second floor there at the Summit. Many of the past inductees and current inductees were in there this morning to view it, and, and there's really some great things there uh, that really, I think, are an inspiration to everybody uh, who looks at that display. One of the reasons we do this dinner is to try to provide some sort of inspiration uh, to our youth. And I think that uh, with our guest speaker tonight, Mary Lou Retton, I think we, once again we are showing that we're committed uh, to helping our youth of the community recognize what good can come from athletics. Uh, many of our young people in this community benefit by the great work of all of you out there who work as volunteers in sports. And something else new in this year's dinner is our Community Service Award this year. And we are so proud to be able to recognize John Conlon here uh, later this evening as our first recipient of that award. Because for all the youth who are out there participating, whatever sport it may be, you need all of you as adult volunteers to give your time and effort to make these youth able to do this. And, and I think this is one of the other things we want to do uh, is one of our visions for the future here is to recognize the people who serve our youth in the community and athletics. In addition, we're continuing our tradition of scholarship awards tonight. We're pleased that we've now exceeded $25,000 in scholarships uh, through all your generosity and particularly now through the generosity of Reliance Savings Bank. And we thank Reliance Savings Bank for making our scholarships possible uh, to our youth. Just a couple thanks that I want to give at this time to some people who really helped make this dinner uh, go. Obviously, Neil Rudell. Neil Rudell does a lot of work behind the scenes and really uh, helps make this thing a reality every year. Uh, I'd also like to uh, thank a few people out there in the audience. Uh, first of all, Kathy Millward. 
Uh, my secretary, who puts all the behind the scenes work and labors hard for many, many months in coordinating uh, all the details of the schedule. Where are you, Kathy? Stand up there, Kathy. Out there. A couple people on our board of directors uh, that also do such a great job. Uh, I thank all the board of directors, but a couple people who put some real long hours in trying to put the last couple days together. I want to acknowledge them too. Steve Kaysen, right down here. Steve, stand, please. And Jenny Moran Wilson. I know she's up there in the top in the second tier there. A thank to all of our corporate sponsors who make this dinner possible, to our selection committee who labors very hard uh, many, many months in advance of this to come up with this great selection of inductees this year. Uh, I would just note to you that we don't feel that we always have all the answers when we put people into um, the Hall of Fame. We are very proud of this year's inductees, and we just think it's just a, such a great class. We're excited. The community is obviously excited by the fact that we've had a waiting list for several weeks uh, of, for this sold-out dinner. But we would tell you near the end of your program, in your program book, that there's information. If you have anybody else that you want us to consider, there's a process you can submit names, and our selection committee will work diligently and hard uh, to come up with those names. I would just like to say that relax tonight. We've had some great, great moments in the past together. It's become a nice evening for families to come out and, and view uh, the great tributes to these inductees. We know it'll be that again tonight. And once again, thank you all for your support. Thank you, David. I have been fortunate enough to MC this banquet every time it's been presented. Uh, I did it back when I had a lot more hair and didn't need these to read. And so I speak from experience, and I hope you'll take my advice that those of you who do want to go to the restroom, when you see me get up to speak, that would be a real good time to go. <laughs> that's just a cue for you, and that's a, a good time. You won't miss anything, I promise. I've been uh, asked to do a lot of things uh, at this banquet, um, including sweeping the floors after it's over. And depending on my performance, I may be relegated to that in two years. But I've never been honored by being asked to be a presenter. And I do so with great humility tonight and hope that I don't do a disservice to our first inductee whose award will be received posthumously. That is Dr. Tom Healy. Dr. Healy was born and raised in Altoona and went to St. Francis Prep. He then went on to the University of Pittsburgh where he starred, not just played, but starred in four sports, a magnificent athlete. Perhaps his best sport was baseball. While he was in college, at the age of 18, the Pirates called and asked him to come down to Pittsburgh for a little bit of a tryout. They had heard about his exploits at the University of Pittsburgh. While he worked out for the Pirates, he so impressed the great Hannes Wagner that Wagner asked him to play on a touring team, including guys like Wagner, Ty Cobb, players like that. And because of that, Connie Mack, who owned, managed, and operated the old Philadelphia Athletics, asked Dr. Healy to play on that team, which he did, the Philadelphia A's, in 1915 and 1916. Now remember now, back in those days, today there are 750-some Major League Baseball players. To, uh, back then, there were 16 teams, there were about 300 players. So to play Major League Baseball, and there was no NFL, and there wasn't any NBA, or I don't think they even invented ice yet, so there was no NHL, <laughs> Uh, you had to be a pretty spectacular baseball player to play back then. He played two seasons at the age of 19 in the, in the major leagues. His last hit in the season of 1916 came off Babe Ruth, who was still pitching back then for Boston before he was traded to New York. He also, after he was done playing baseball, was getting his dentistry practice started, played one year of semi-pro football in Cleveland a magnificent athletic career, a magnificent life, uh, and a magnificent family, some members of whom I've met here this evening. It is my distinct pleasure, pleasure and honor to present posthumously to Dr. Tom Healy introduction into the Blair County Sports Hall of Fame, and here to accept the award is his son, John Healy. John? <laughs>
Thanks, Stan. Thank you very much for the nice introduction. And I want to thank Neil Rudell for the wonderful article that he put in the, uh, the mirror on uh, last Friday. It was, it was exceptional. Uh, and there's, since this is, I guess, like the Academy Awards, you can thank other people. I'd like to thank the board for having nominated my dad and uh, put him in the position that he was able to receive this one. But I also would like to uh, uh, thank Tom Healy, Dr. Tom Healy, who is a, who is a cousin, and uh, you'll hear that I have a lot of cousins in this area. And Tom was the one that really put some a real effort into getting him considered and nominated. And if you could, Tom, why don't you stand up so that people can see you? And I'd also, before he receives, I'd also like to congratulate Mike Irwin. Some of you know that you know that Mike is uh, the, one of the first to be uh, uh, have a father-son deal coming on this board, but he's also, on this time, we're cousins. And so we go back to uh, County Cork, the city of Donnamore, where Peggy O'Leary and Patrick Healy got together and sired a very large group of people. And I think there's four tables of them here now. <laughs> and, I, and I think they should all stand up. They're all over here, and we're all, and we're, and we're all related. So. My, uh, <clears throat> after my dad finished playing baseball, he went into the service and went to Cleveland uh, to start his dental practice and also to get married. And while uh, during the 20s in Cleveland, he played, as uh, Stan said, he played some semi-pro football, but he also played semi-pro baseball. So, I mean, he really stayed with the sports for a long time because he really liked them. And then in the 30s and 40s, he got involved more in his dentistry and got into research and did quite a bit of research on fluorides and did some of the initial work on getting fluorides in the water and he was, the, he was an instrumental in having it put in the water in Cleveland for the first time. And then he received, because of this, because then he was worldwide, recognized worldwide, he received not only national but international awards from both medical and dental. But as my kids and I tell them all about him, say, but always remember, Dad, that he was a jock. <laughs> and he would have been so proud to have received this. Uh, when Neil Rudell interviewed me, he asked me, he said, what would your dad, you know, what would the reaction of your dad be when he received this? And I said, boy, he'd just be in awe. He would be just overwhelmed because Coming back home before a local crowd and everything to receive this is sort of like the prophet coming home and being accepted and so forth. But <clears throat> my sisters and I, we knew a different Tom Healy. I read a, I read a sports uh, article about him at the time that he played, and he was, he was identified as a feisty, red-headed Irishman, and, uh, which probably described what he was like when he was, when, when he was in his uh, athletic career. But we knew him as a very quiet, gentlemanly person who was very pious, and uh, he was very kind, and we never saw any of that feistiness. And so I thought about it, and I thought, what would he do when, if he were to come up here to accept this, uh, this magnificent award? And if he were here, I'm sure that all he would say would be, thank you very much, and sit down. So I'll say thank you very much. I just met John and his sister right before the banquet, and I liked them immediately, not just because we're both from Cleveland, because I figured that being Mike Irwin's cousin, I give him no credit for that, but the mere fact that he would admit it, <laughs> I knew that he guy after my own heart. Our next presenter is not from Blair County, but is from the state, Clearfield. And he has great working knowledge of this area because he was a wrestler at Penn State. That's understating it. He was the captain of the Penn State wrestling team. 
He went into coaching and decided to coach those smart guys in the Ivy League at Princeton. And in a 29-year career, listen to this now, he won 382 matches, including 10 Ivy League titles. Here to present Johnny Orr is Johnny Johnston. There's a very nice uh, write-up of John in the program, so I'll try to touch on some other things about him. Wrestling is a very unique sport. 60% of the college weight classes and an equal percentage of the high school weight classes are 165 pounds or under. This affords the smaller athlete the opportunity to compete. At the same time, most of our combative sports are going after the larger individual. In order to be competitive, the athlete in the arena with no one else but himself has to be good both offensively and defensively with heavy emphasis on the offense. John Orr, for most of his collegiate career, was a middleweight but he also competed at one stage in his college wrestling career in five of those college wrestling weight classes. In college, there are 10 weight classes. That is a very unusual situation. John was defensively sound, being able to effectively control and counter the best attacks the opponents could muster. Offense however, was John's forte. He was very skillful mechanically, very calculating, and he presented a relentless offensive attack on his opponents. He may have wrestled opponents that were quicker or stronger, and some may have been equally as skillful. But he seldom wrestled an opponent that had a greater passion to win or a greater tenacity to wrestle mentally tough. In addition, in the words of that great American philosopher, Yogi Berra, <laughs> it's not over till it's over. John Orr wrestled every second of every minute he was on the mat. John had a goal-oriented philosophy toward wrestling. He was mentally very tough, and the better he became, the harder he worked and prepared for the next contest. Short, he was a fiery competitor. During John's last two years at Princeton, he would weigh in at 142 pounds. Nevertheless, we used him in the 142 pound class and or the 150 pound class wherever the opposition presented the toughest competition. John, in addition, was an inspirational team leader, persuading his teammates to strive to perform to their maximum. Through his quality ethical influence, our team performed on most occasions above their ability range in order to live up to John's expectations. In fact, I thought we had a few more overachieving teams during John's era. As a result of sound encouragement and support from his parents, John and Olga Orr, Johnny was also a very good academic student in a fiercely competitive environment. In his senior year at Princeton, John received the Roper Award honoring the outstanding senior male student athlete for scholarship and athletic achievement. Although we're here tonight at this moment to honor jo John Orr, I am both thankful and honored myself. Thankful for John's family encouragement for him to achieve both academically and athletically at the highest level and honored that I had the opportunity to have seat number one, row number one, throughout John's college career. At this time, 
I have the honor and the pleasure to present one of Blair County's 1998 Hall of Fame inductees, John Orr. Thank you, Johnny. It's hard to believe that it's been 18 years since I went to Princeton as a 17-year-old freshman to wrestle for Johnny. And it didn't take me long to realize it was one of the best decisions that I've ever made. Johnny wasn't just a great coach, but he was a great role model. And one of his lessons that I've always taken to heart was that when something like wrestling has been good to you, it's important to give something back to it. And I've tried really hard to follow Johnny's advice in one of my favorite events that I do in the area, I'd like to come back and wrestle and coach at, J at Joey Baranek's summer camp out at the Hollysburg Junior High School. The, uh, the response here tonight is just unbelievable. I'm, I'm truly honored and to see all the people come out and support this event is, is, is very heartwarming. When I looked through the list of previous inductees, I was just amazed at how many great athletes the area has produced. Wade Chalice is probably one of the world's best wrestlers of all time. I was a former inductee. I can remember my dad taking me to the Jaffa Mosque and watching Brad Benson wrestle in the, in the regional finals. And he went on to win a state title. So not a bad football player, either, but he was a pretty good wrestler as well. <laughs> I've always been a big fan of Lisa Fubio's. I actually went down and watched Lisa and my friend Lisa Kelly wrestle in Altoona's uh, first state championship game. I don't think anybody would have thought back then that Altoona would make so many repeat trips to the finals. I'd also like to thank some of the people that have helped me along the way. New Rodell and John Hartzog and Jimmy Lane for all the great coverage they've given me over the years. Besides Johnny, I've had a lot of outstanding coaches. Tim Craw, who ran the YMCA program when I was in sixth grade. Bill Smearman, Ralph Bennett at Roosevelt Junior High, Marty Rusnak, Matty McKee, and Jim Torsell at Altoona. All those coaches dedicated a lot of their time to make our team successful, and I'm, and I'm very thankful for all their help. Some of my best memories are some of the championship matches that our teams competed in. And I'll never forget in high school when Danny Brannick tied to returning state runner-up to seal the victory against Clearfield for the league championship, which, by the way, was Johnny's alma mater. Very apropos. Now in college, one of the highlights was defeating Cornell to win the Ivy League championship. It was the first title we'd won in seven years, and, and that really meant a lot to me. I'd also like to thank Wendy and the rest of my family for all their support. My parents for spending all those weekends in the gym, taking me to wrestling matches. My grandparents for all their encouragement, especially my grandmother. She, she must have made thousands of meatballs from for me and my teammates over the years. My sister and brother, Tanya and Billy, for put, putting up with me when I'm sure I was fairly tough to be around. And I'd like to recognize Wendy's mom, Norma, who's here tonight as well. The Altoona area has really been a, a, a great place to grow up, and I have a lot of good memories of, of the area. And the sense of community is really amazing. And I think if you just look at all the people that are here tonight, that that's the proof of that. My friends have always been very important to me, and I've stayed close with a lot of the people that I grew up with in the area. And some of them are here tonight, and I'd like to, to recognize a few of them. My good friend Ronnie Park and his wife Kelly. I've been friends with Ronnie for almost 30 years now. It's, it's hard to believe since uh, before we were in first grade. Next to them, Steve Stevenson and his wife Christine. Steve and I have been friends since, since junior high. Steve was probably the toughest weight training partner I've ever had in my life. I think he still takes delight in that. <laughs> I'd like to also recognize Josh Port. Josh and I have been friends since we were kids and went to the Kiwanis camp out in Sinking Valley. And we now have the, the common experience of having three kids under the age of five. So we've got a few, <laughs> a few things to talk about. A special thanks to Gail Flagel, who hosted my parents on all their trips to Princeton, and also put up with them. She may be a saint. 
And finally, I'd like to thank Bill Tucker. Bill was an avid Penn State wrestling fan who passed away several years ago. But through Bill, Wendy and I got to know Pat and Ruth Darty, And since then, they've become like a part of our family. Wrestling has been very important to me, and it's really threaded its way into everything I've done my whole life, it seems. I really love the camaraderie. I love the competition. But I especially love that adrenaline that came with a big match. And I don't have any regrets other than I would have really, truly liked to have won a national championship for Johnny. Didn't quite pull that one off. I do miss that feeling. And nothing's really been able to replace it since then in, in quite that way. I think wrestling is a great sport. And any of the parents out there that have young kids, I'd encourage you to have them give it a try. It's a great character builder. It teaches a lot of self-discipline. It's very worthwhile. Thanks again, and thanks to all the people who put so much hard work into the, organizing this event. You did a great job. My thanks to Curtis back in the kitchen who, who made sure everything worked out okay there. <laughs> and thank you. It's very, I'm very honored. Thank you, Johnny. You know, just for, just for a second there, I thought he was going to turn and say, I've been watching Lisa Fubio play basketball since I was a little kid. And I said, no, he went to Princeton. He's smarter than that. And he, he stopped just short of that. I thought that was a good move. With tonight's five inductees, that swells the membership to the Blair County Sports Hall of Fame to 44. And we do have some members in the audience tonight. We'd like to introduce them and recognize them. We will ask them please to stand when we call your name. 1996 inductee, Denver Junie Smith. Junie? Nineteen ninety four inductee, Harry Clark. Also from the class of ninety four, Tony Georgiana. Nineteen ninety four was a very good year, representing ninety four also. Bill Ianaselli. One of those old timers from the class of 1990, the first and only woman in the Blair County Sports Hall of Fame until tonight, Fredina Ingold. From the class of 1988, Bill Parsons. And also from the class of 88, John Ebersol. I used to get riled up when pitchers in baseball up for the Hall of Fame would get rejected even though they had won 300 games. What more does a guy have to do? They did it with Early Wynn, they did it with Phil Negro, they tried to do it with Don Sutton. What more do you have to do to get into a Hall of Fame? What will they say about a basketball coach that has won 500 games? You know who I'm talking about, our Tannehill. Right here in Altoona, 500 wins as a coach. The guys I played high school basketball with couldn't even count the 500. <laughs> he won four PIAA titles. And frankly, and this is from a reporter's perspective, he established girls basketball in central Pennsylvania. And above and beyond that, he set a standard in the entire state of Pennsylvania for girls basketball. And maybe his most important contribution is that through his coaching, he has been able to gather 20 Division I scholarships for the girls that he has coached. There is no greater tribute to a coach than to see his protégés move on to bigger and better things. Here to present Lisa Garrett, Art Tannehill.
Thank you, Stan. <clears throat> Uh, one of the things you have to remember that sometimes if you hang around for 32 years, you get lucky enough to win a few games. So I've been around for 33, so what's that tell you? Tonight, um, I'd like to share with you a little story. In the spring of 1978, a young lady was asked to come to the field house to be evaluated for her participation in girls basketball for the next coming season. And after a, a short period of evaluation, this young lady was taken aside and said, um, um, young lady, we think you can be a good basketball player, but you can't shoot a lick. And this young lady only went on to score 1,159 points in her career, score in double figures in only 62 games that she played, and scored 481 points in her senior year, all of which are still records. And the coach told her that if she would decide to come out, work hard, that maybe, just maybe, she'd be able to help out Tuna to a state championship sometime soon. Well, what's that tell you about the coach? <laughs> Little did he know how much Lisa Fubio would impact girls basketball in Altoona in all of central Pennsylvania. Tonight, up here at the head table, we honor a lot of great athletes. Dedication, hard work, attitude, and athletic ability are words that we can all use to describe them. But as I was making my preparations for tonight's introduction, one word kept coming up every time I thought about it as to what made Lisa Fubio special? And that one word was magnetism. Magnetism. She drew nine other athletes into her circle of belief that if you work hard and you dedicate yourself to the sport, it would all lead to success. Magnetism that drew more people into the field house at Altoona than anyone ever dared to imagine to watch a girls basketball game. Magnetism that drew Division I college coaches from Texas to Connecticut to the program for the first time ever. Magnetism that drew fine young male athlete to her in high school that continued on into college. <laughs> that eventually led to her marriage and four lovely, very athletic children. Magnetism that made little girls all over the city carry around basketballs and hope to be either like Lisa Fubio or to be a lady lion. And magnetism that today, even after her playing days are almost over, People flock to her at work. She coaches young children and draws a crowd. She works for the school PTO in a church and draws crowds. Magnetism that eventually led to a coach-player relationship that only is surpassed by that coach coaching his own daughter. Tonight is with great honor, respect, admiration and love that I present to you the first lady of Lady Lion basketball in Altoona, Lisa Fubio Garrett. First of all, let me take this opportunity to thank the Blair County Sports Hall of Fame for this induction. I realize that without the many talents of my 1981 teammates, and without the growth and continued success of girls basketball here in this area for all the programs, I may not be here. I am very proud and truly honored to be your first female basketball inductee. 
because I know there will be many, many more to follow. So thank you to the Hall of Fame committee for this great honor and this unforgettable weekend. Coach, <clears throat> excuse me, not too long ago here in this casino, you said these words and you were talking about another coach and you were complimenting and they, they just kind of hit home with me. You said that there are many good athletes that come through a program, but it takes the coach to make a good athlete a great athlete and instill in them the confidence and belief as to how far they can carry a program. Well, Coach, I may have been a good athlete, but it was definitely you who made me a great basketball player. And it was you who gave me and the rest of those 1981 Lady Lions the knowledge of the game and the confidence to help get things rolling to make girls basketball as successful as it is today in our area. I love and respect you not only as my coach, but as my friend, so thank you. <clears throat> Probably the, the greatest source of happiness in my life comes from my family. I'm the third of four children. I have an older sister, Terry, who didn't play sports, but her enthusiasm for a game that she didn't know much about but supported me in any way certainly meant a lot to me. My older brother, Tony, my idol. He had the most intense competitive spirit I have ever seen, and he still does. And he taught me by example. My younger sister, Mary, I have always admired for her no-nonsense attitude and ability to handle any challenge that is thrown her way. My parents, Tony and Marlene Fubio, my true source of inspiration. My dad taught me to always believe in myself and that I could be anything I wanted to be or achieve any goal I had ever set through hard work and commitment. My mother's support was always steady. She has a very honest way about her. She taught me how to keep success in the proper perspective. Anything I've ever done in life, as well as athletics, has been because I wanted to make them proud of me. And I think that they are. But you know, the best thing about parents is that even when we make mistakes or do things we're not very proud of, they love us just the same anyway. So thank you, I love you. Uh, my husband, Corey, has given me the four greatest gifts of all, our children, Lauren, Rachel, Matthew, and Brady. Corey has quietly supported me in everything I've ever done since we were 16 years old, and he continues to encourage me to be my best even today. I feel very fortunate to be married to him, and we are very lucky to be able to raise our family right here in Blair County, a community that embraced us as young athletes and continues to encourage us. We only hope that we can give back to all of you the support that you've so generously given to us over these years. Let me just close with, with a bit of a confession. When Dave Andrews called me back in August and told me the good news of this selection, I was speechless. Very honored, but I was speechless. Then when I realized who the other inductees would be, both past and present, and of course all of their presenters and their great accomplishments, I couldn't help but be intimidated and afraid I might just feel a little bit out of place up here. But let me assure you that because of the Hall of Fame committee and all of its members, because of the support of my family and friends, and because of all of you here in this room tonight, I have never felt more at home. And for that, I thank you all very, very much. Nicely said, Lisa. And we should tell you that the ages of her children are 11, 9, 8, and 5. So I know at least one person who's glad for an evening out. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> and they're sitting right in front here. Why don't you, why don't you guys stand up? <laughs> Corey, I was going to ask you to stand up, but I realize you can't. Uh, so you just stay seated there and rest up. And Art, I, I hope that you got a two-night deal on the Tux rental because there's a space for you in the Hall of Fame, and I, and I hope it's very soon. One of the most important moments of the banquet, of the induction ceremony, is upon us now, and that is the presentation of the scholarship awards 
for 1998. This banquet stands for more than just honoring its great athletes and the strong sense of community that both Art and Lisa mentioned. This is part of the strong sense of community. We want to offer our thanks for the support of Reliance Savings, who has taken over the scholarship fund and has grown it immensely. Um, it's a very valuable source in the community and a very important part of our banquet each year or every other year. Now here representing Reliance Savings to present this year's scholarships awards, Bruce Schiminger. Bruce? Thanks, Dan. Love the show. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> Reliance Savings Bank is pleased to sponsor the Hall of Fame scholarships for the second uh, consecutive year. As Stan said, uh, the bank has made a very strong commitment to the youth of the area in the past few years, and uh, we find these scholarships to be an excellent way for us to help fulfill that uh, commitment. With that, uh, I would like to introduce the 1998 scholarship winners, and I have a little synopsis of each I would like to read before we, we call them up here for their check and also uh, a plaque that we have for them. The first winner is Kristen Stopp of Altoona Area High School. Kristen ranks number one in Altoona's graduating class and has an SAT score of 1360. She's a four-time letter winner in tennis, was District 6 singles runner-up in 1977 and District 6 doubles runner-up in 1996. She played Altoona's number one position as a senior and was unbeaten in dual meet competition for four years. Kristen participates in numerous school activities and has received a variety of honors and awards. And she is also very active in uh, a few community-related projects. Kristen, if you could uh, please come forward. It is an extreme honor for me to be up here tonight with all of these great athletes who are being honored here in order to accept this award. I would like to thank the Blair County Sports Hall of Fame and the Scholarship Committee for choosing me to be this year's recipient. This scholarship will be of great use to me as I continue my education at Penn State. And it has a special meaning for me because it represents two things to which I have always dedicated myself, academics and athletics. It is my philosophy that the two go hand in hand, and that much can be learned about one from the other. The work ethic and dedication I have developed throughout my years of schooling have helped me on the court, and I have carried the lessons I have learned from teamwork, competition, and mental toughness into the classroom. My successes would not have been possible, however, without the support and guidance of my teachers and coaches, who were never afraid to push me and who never accepted less than my very best. It was my coach, Herb Ferris, who taught me the most valuable lessons about mental toughness and positivism. And it was my coach, Eric Hoven, who helped me to realize that self-confidence is the most important element in achieving any goal. I would also like to thank the two people who have helped and supported me the most in all of my endeavors, my parents. They instilled in me my values, my work ethic, and my motivation, and I honestly don't know where I would be without them. In closing, I would like to congratulate all of this year's Sports Hall of Fame inductees and once again express my sincere thanks for this award. I'm truly very honored. Thank you. Our second scholarship winner is Jeremy Geyer of Bellwood Annis High School. Jeremy ranks ninth in his senior class and has an SAT score of 1260. He has won three letters in both football and baseball. As a running back and a catcher, he's been named to various county all-star teams. 
Like Kristen, he also participates in a number of school and outside activities. And just recently, he received a $1,000 scholarship from the Central Pennsylvania chapter of the National Football Foundation and College Hall of Fame. Jeremy, could you come forward, please? I would like to thank Mr. John Hayes for nominating me for this scholarship, as well as for everything he has done for me in the past. I would also like to thank the Blair County Sports Hall of Fame, Reliance Savings Association, and all the people involved in selecting the scholarship winners. I plan to attend the College of Agricultural and Life Sciences at North Carolina State University, where I plan to major in turf grass management, which is a four-year program of study. This scholarship will be helpful to me in paying the out-of-state tuition and other costs that I will encounter. I am honored to be here among so many great athletes, and I feel privileged to receive this scholarship when there are so many other fine student athletes in our area. I believe it is very important that organizations such as the Blair County Sports Hall of Fame give scholarships to students to help them further their education, because a good education is the basis for young people to become successful and be an important part of tomorrow's society. Thank you. Thank you. That's good. Thank you again. Thank you, Bruce, for the love the show comment. I, I, I knew there was one out there. I guess you're it. And Kristen, don't leave when the banquet's over. My backhand volley just stinks. <laughs> if you could just give me some help. I played this morning, please. I'm... A lot of us up here have been pretty tough on Neil Riddell tonight. Some nasty comments, some dirty comments, underhanded, and I think I speak for everyone up here that we really meant everything we said. <laughs> but if you're looking for the driving force behind this installation banquet, year in, year out. And remember now, we only meet every other year. This is an ongoing, every year process for Dave, and especially Neil. Uh, we finally got him in the monkey suit. Doesn't look too bad either. Um, here to present um, an inaugural award is really the driving force behind this affair, Neil Riddell from the Altoona Mirror. Neil. Thank you, Stan. Appreciate Stan freeing up his schedule. He's been working overtime uh, public relations manager with Guy Junker. <laughs> <laughs> Honored inductees, distinguished presenters, Mary Lou, Dave Andrews, Hall of Fame supporters. When the Blair County Sports Hall of Fame sought nominations, for its first community service award, there were a number of excellent candidates. And then in a class by himself was John Conlon, whose nomination was accompanied by more than 500 signatures. At first, of course, we were a little suspicious. John does have a big family, <laughs> evidenced here tonight. But after a thorough handwriting analysis, disproved that John had signed the names of all 500 Altoona Parochial League members by himself. We were confident we could proceed. John Conlon has coached in the APL for 30 years and served as league director for another 10. But more than his longevity is the passion and the commitment he has devoted to hundreds of kids he has coached. His labor of love has made him not only a pillar, but a foundation of the Bishop Guilfoyle and local sports community. Throughout his life, John Conlon has been consistent. He's done for others. John wrote two books on Bishop Guilfoyle football. He's been the common denominator 
between Altoona Catholic and BG, and rarely does somebody pass away connected to sports in Altoona that John doesn't pen one of his patented obituaries in the Sunday sports mailbag. Never mind that he needs, contrary to his opinion, a little editing, <laughs> and that he has yet to actually learn how to use a typewriter. Those people are going online, but uh, John's still handwriting, but we appreciate it. Now John, as most of us know, is facing another challenge. He went in for back surgery last fall and didn't walk away. But you'd never know it from his, his adversity, from his remarkable attitude, and he, like all of us, hopes and prays he'll walk again someday. In the meantime, he fully intends to coach in the Altoona Parochial League again next season from his wheelchair. There have been many Conlins who have impacted the Blair County sports scene. John's father, Dick, was a 1988 inductee. But there's only been one John Conlin, and on behalf of the Blair County Sports Hall of Fame, it is my distinct pleasure to present him with our first community service award. We are sure there's no one more deserving. Much. I told Neil uh, when he's going to introduce me, I said, now, all I want you to do is introduce me. I don't want you to canonize me. <laughs> well, that came pretty close to canonization. When you work in a program for a long time, you hear all kind of accolades, oh, isn't that wonderful? But in essence, it's, it's not, when a person stays in that long, he's getting something out of it. In my case, I certainly got more out of it than I put into it. I've been involved with some very wonderful, wonderful people, and I had some very wonderful experiences. Uh, I'd like, first of all, to thank the Hall of Fame for creating the award. I'm very proud to win it for the first time, first recipient. There was five people who went out and got the names, not all mine, my signatures. Uh, at the time, I knew nothing about it. I was in the hospital for 40 days and wasn't worried about signatures. I'd like to tell you that Tom Lang, Fred McConnell, Frank Wiley, Jerry Millarn, and Dr. Trivis went out and solicited those names, and I'm internally thankful to them. I'm thankful to my wife and five daughters for the support they have given me over the years. Some of the things that sticks in my mind about coaching is I, I've had an opportunity to watch these kids. I, I coach in the grade school, and I see them go on to junior high and high school and college, and it's enlightening to see them be so successful. Eight of kids that I've coached have went on to win the Joe Cohen Blanket Award at Bishop Gilfoyle. I've had kids go on to Alton High School without, don't want to mention names, but uh, in the Erie McDowell game last year, the little Geist boy scored 18 of the 20 points and I had the privilege of coaching him in grade school. So all in all, it's, it's been very good to me. I thank you very much. Uh, I thank God, and I don't want to seem heroic or noble, for giving me I, what I consider the wisdom to know that I'm coaching very young people, and at my level, you don't have to win because you're not going to fire me. <laughs> So I'd like to think that I taught something besides football. 
we wind up all our practices with a prayer. Any bad language out of a kid, they don't play the next week. I'm teaching morals and values in football. And I can hope I can continue. One of the other privileges that I had the opportunity to coach my grandchildren. And I have another young one coming. And if God allows me, I'll be around to coach him. Thank you very much. Congratulations, John. I can think of four professional sports league that could use you right away. And Neil, if I thought you were going to be funny, I wouldn't have waited 11 years to let you talk. This is an old cliche, but if you look in the dictionary under the word coach, you are liable to find Dan Radakovich's picture next to where the definition should be. He's been in it his entire life. He coached 12 years at Penn State and actually recruited Mike Irwin. Joe Paterno still hasn't talked to Radakovich for that. He spent 18 years in the National Football League. However, there is no truth to the rumor that he spent nine months with each and every one of the teams. <laughs> Bounced around a bit, but you know what, Rad? The expansion's coming. Uh, so there are a couple more teams that may have something for you. You may know him and probably do know him, in addition to his work at Penn State, as being a coach with Chuck Knoll and the Pittsburgh Steelers in the early and then mid-'70s and was the offensive line coach when the Steelers won their first of two, or both the first two Super Bowls in the 74 and 75 seasons. And I think that the highest compliment ever paid to Dan Radakovich is that he is the only assistant coach that Chuck Knoll ever took back. Rad was with Chuck Knoll when he started in Pittsburgh and then Dan took the defensive coordinator's job at Colorado in 72 and 73, University of Colorado. And when you left Chuck Knoll, unless it was for a head coaching job, which really didn't happen to any of his assistants, in Chuck's mind, you know, he's German, you were a traitor, and uh, that was it for you. But so good was Dan Radakovich that he was welcomed back with empty arms. He coached a nameless... <laughs> He coached a by and large nameless but talented offensive unit. Mike Webster's in the Hall of Fame, but back in those days, the Sam Davises and John Kolbs and Jim Clax and Jerry Mullins, he molded them into a ferocious offensive line. They were light and they quick and they rewrote the definition to a trapping running game and this was the mastermind behind it. And in case you forget the two Super Bowl rings that he was involved with Pittsburgh, you remember those pictures of those Steelers with their muscles bulging in the short sleeves? It was Dan Radakovich who invented a practice still used today. He had the equipment man sew the jerseys very tight right around the bicep so that the defensive lineman couldn't grab them and yank them one way or the other. That was actually done by design. And it was Dan Radakovich's idea. And 25 years later, it is still a standard and common practice in the National Football League. I suppose if we were to define Dan Radakovich, and the players all called him Bad Rad, not because he was a bad rad, but because he was bad rad. He had a tremendous focus. Football was his entire life, and oftentimes would be seen wandering the halls of Three River Stadium, dreaming of X's and O's, and you'd say hello to him, and he'd just walk right past you. He didn't mean to slight you. He just wasn't aware. And to prove that story, and this is true, the Steelers were getting ready for a big game, and the coaches were all watching film very late at night, every night, for this game. May have been a playoff game. And Rad was devising strategies on how to block, so on and so forth, and what to do here, and so on and so forth. He finally left the office very late at night and drove home, parked the car, walked up the driveway, went into the house, sat down at the kitchen table, I wasn't in Pittsburgh, it was Cincinnati, it's a true story, I was told otherwise. He, he, do they have any big games there in football? 
Sorry, Oscar. <laughs> Back then, you ruined my story. Well, it's your story. He's sitting in the kitchen, and in walks a woman. It's his next door neighbor. And she says, what are you doing in my house at midnight? He actually sat in somebody else's kitchen and never recognized the fact until the woman who lived there said, what are you doing here? <laughs> so absorbed was he. In any event, I'm sure he's quite focused tonight. Dan, we're in Altoona. <laughs> and here to present inductee Mike Irwin is Dan Radakovich. <laughs> He got that story almost right. The house was three blocks away. There were four kids set in the kitchen table. And I had put my books up on the, I was going to law school and coaching football at the time. You know, doing, my mind was quite intense then. I put my books on a refrigerator, sat behind the kitchen, t the kitchen table, looked up. I saw this lady in a house coat. I saw four kids, I looked over and I saw this guy in a t-shirt like uh, Marlon Brando in a streetcar named Desire with no shoes on and Levi's. And I looked around and I said, I said, what the hell's going on? Where's Nancy? <laughs> Who's my wife? <laughs> and, and nobody said anything. <laughs> and I looked around and it dawned on me. I said, oh, pardon me. I said, I think I'm in the wrong house. <laughs> and the lady put her hands on her hips and said, yes, I think you are. <laughs> so I got up, got my books, walked out past the husband. He never said a word. He had his arm on the fireplace like this, went right back out, went home, and told my wife, I said, you better call him. She says, I'm, she says, I'm not calling them. Tell them what happened. I says, I can't call them. I says, what the hell is that guy going to do? He, he'll probably kill his wife. Because I thought, yeah, I was, I was a pretty good looking 35 year old then. Anyway, I, I don't know. I didn't know he was going to tell that story. I, I don't know. And I have no idea who, who, who told him. But anyway. Uh, I got a, I'm glad, I was glad to hear that so, somebody else gave uh, Neil uh, some static because when Neil called me up and asked me to be the presenter for Mike Irwin, I said, Neil, Mike Irwin? He says, yeah. He says, well, he said, we try to get paternal. He's busy and stuff. But I said, Neil, Mike Irwin? I says, that's 35 years ago. He says, well, I would like to, I says, the only thing I remember about Mike Irwin, he had red hair and he had a movie star for a mother. <laughs> you know, I mean, you, start, you, 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 you try to think back. Now, I've been with a lot more teams than he said. I've been with uh, seven NFL teams, two of them twice, five colleges, and I've owned 12 houses, been in seven different apartments. Uh, so I've been around, and, and, and it's been a long time since I was in this area. I used to be the, the Penn State recruiter uh, for this area. In fact, I looked at the program, Jim, wanted to see how I miss you, and Paterno had the area at that time. I didn't take over until 62. So, so uh, I didn't coach Mike. I coached defense, but I didn't coach Mike. Mike was uh, uh, a back. Anyway, when I first heard about Mike, I get a call from John Hyder. Now, John was Mike's high school football coach, basketball coach, and probably you know, the main reason that Mike went to Penn State. But I get a call from John, and he says, Rod, you better get over here. Now, I'd recruited Bill Huber a couple of years earlier from the same high school, who, who started for three years for us at Penn State, a great football player. And I said, why? He says, well, I got the best pack in the state. I said, uh, well, you do. I says, who is he? Mike Irwin. I said, well, Tell me about him. How big is he? Oh, he's just about 5'10", 11. I said, what's he weigh? He said, oh, I don't know, about 170 pounds. I says, uh, I said, he played basketball. He says, oh, yeah, he's a starter for me. 
He says, by the way, he says he, he can stand there and dunk. I said, John, I'll be right over. <laughs> so I went over to recruit Mike, and there's a story on page 22 about us almost losing Mike, and, uh, which, is, which is true. It doesn't quite tell the whole story there, but uh, uh, we recruited Mike, and I, of course, visited at least once a week and whatever you were allowed to do, and there weren't too many rules in those days, and <laughs> phone calls and everything, and uh, the, Mike had a connection with Marilyn. I think he had a relative, his dad's brother or somebody, grandfather, somebody was... Uh, down in that area, and he had gone there and visited and liked it. And uh, one day, uh, the coach from Maryland shows up, and it's near the time to, to decide where you're going to school. And uh, John Hyder calls me because he thinks Mike's going to Maryland, and I'm not around. And so he calls Paterno. Paterno and I were both, uh, Paterno was just an assistant then. We were both assistants on the staff, and uh, Rip Engel was the head coach. And uh, so Joe gets in a car and he jumps over and he gets there just as they're leaving the gym with the Maryland coach. And he grabs Mike and Mike's buddy and grabs him and says, come on, we're going to dinner. And the Maryland coach just stood there, didn't know what happened. Mike didn't know what was going on. He told Heider to meet him secretly, he'd meet him later. So they go to dinner at this nice place in Altoona. They walk in and there's the Maryland coach sitting at the place where they went to dinner. But anyway, uh, uh, I think uh, Mike either, or Joe either made Mike commit, or however we did it, however he twisted his arm, and Mike called me uh, either that night or the next day or something, and uh, anyway, so we got, we got Mike Irwin. Now, when Mike was at Penn State, what do I remember about him? Well, he was one of the first guys to start right away. He started right away as a sophomore. And we didn't have too many, too many guys that did that. I, uh, uh, there are probably only about three or four uh, that ever did that at Penn State that started right away. And when he was a sophomore, we didn't know what to do with him. Mike was our best back on offense. He was our best back on defense. So uh, we decided to play him on offense. Or uh, no, on defense. And uh, the most memorable game, of course, might be the greatest defensive game in Penn State history. Might be. John Ebersol played on a team that without a doubt had one of the greatest defenses in the history of college football. But we beat Ohio State 27 to nothing. When the first team walked off the field, they had a total offense, that's running and passing, of a minus 14 yards. Uh, they didn't have a first down until the fourth quarter. That was by a penalty. And the defense was only in the game 30 some plays which meant if Ohio State had the ball 10 times, it was three downs and out every time. And it's, it, uh, that team, by the way, ended up, shot out, a, shot out a couple other people, uh, uh, had one of the greatest defensive teams ever, and although the record was only six and four, uh, may have been, at the end of the season, as good a team as Penn State's ever had. Now, after that, we moved Mike to offense, then back to defense, okay, then back to offense. So he had a problem in the fact that we weren't loaded in 65 and 66, especially in 66. And we played them both ways in 1966. But we finally got him off track, or on track, uh, when we put him on offense. You know, he averaged over five yards a carry. He scored a touchdown one every time, t 10 times he carried the ball. But uh, we just didn't give him the ball enough, I guess, on offense. But if he would have played in the days of one platoon football, of course, I think he'd have been a first string All American. But anyway, uh, he, he was played a pivotal role in Joe Paterno's career. You know, Joe Paterno is a very successful coach right now, but at that time, he was struggling. We were five, we ended up that first season five and five. In the middle of that season, the athletic director up in the box turns to me, he comes in the press box, I worked the press box, and says, if we don't get rid of that eye formation, we're gonna get a new head coach. This is 1965. So I talked it over with George Welsh, my assistant. I said, what do you do? He said, you better tell Joe. I said, okay, I tell Joe. So I told Joe. Joe goes in, chews out the athletic director, who was Ernie McCoy. 
He comes back and he says, you know, Rad, he says, he was right, but I don't want him to know that. He says, we're going to stay in the eye formation one more, one more week. He says, he says, then we're getting out of it. So we stayed in the eye formation one more week. Then we put Mike Irwin on offense. We went back to the, our wing tee. We beat West Virginia by 40-some points and probably saved Paterno's job. Anyway, <laughs> I got another little thing. I went up. I got here a little early. I got here at 1 o'clock. And I brought Bob Kane with me who was the middle linebacker in that 64 game I told you about and played two years with Mike, 64 and 5, is the first string linebacker for Penn State. And we decided to go up Penn State. We thought they'd be practicing, but they weren't. They'd practiced in the mornings. So we went over to see Bob Phillips, who was one of Mike's coaches his last year. And Bob has Parkinson's disease. And he was in there. We went to the nursing home. And he's sitting there. And I says, hey, he says, what are you doing here? And I said, you know, Bob, I'm going to be the presenter for Mike Irwin. He says, oh, yeah. He says, the redhead. He says, he was a good player. He says, but he used to throw up before every game. <laughs> so Mike was, I think, a little nervous. But one of the good aspects of that is I told you about that West Virginia game when we moved them. It was a pivotal game in Paterno's career. Is we had a back called Bob Campbell, who was an outstanding sophomore, but didn't hustle too much. And uh, when we got Mike on offense, we called Campbell in and we said, "Bobby, he says, we said, this is the guy that we want you to imitate. We want you to practice like Mike." Okay. And Campbell got the message, and he went on. He's the guy that won the won the Gator or the uh, Orange Bowl in uh, Frost the Grundy Feet in 1968 on the last play of the game. Anyway, I would like now to present Mike Irwin as your Hall of Famer. Actually, I didn't want to go to Penn State, <laughs> but my mother forced me to go to Penn State. She liked Dan Radakovich so much. You were her hero, Rad. And she was so glad when you were coming tonight. And Mom, I didn't realize you were pretty good looking when you were uh, younger. Uh, John Ayers said that Rad made a few comments about him, about you last night, so. I heard you weren't all bad, I guess, Mom. <clears throat> First thing I would like to do is congratulate the other inductees here this evening. It's a great honor to win with all of you. I enjoyed this week and, and meeting you. A couple I'd heard about you, knew about you, but it's a, it's a pleasure. It's a class and, and a, a certain amount of camaraderie that you have with the, you know, your fellow inductees. So I'm proud to go in my other inductees and especially uh, cousin John Healy. It was the uh, first time I met John, and he's my third cousin, I didn't realize. And uh, I'm trying to think of the, the Healy connection, and I remember Neil telling me that the first time when my dad was inducted into this Hall of Fame a while back, that he called my mother to get some information. And instead of my mother giving information about my dad, she started giving information about herself. She was saying how fast she was she was a, when she was a kid. <laughs> I think she was uh, petitioning to come into the Hall of Fame. <laughs> but mom, uh, my grandmother was a Healy, and I, I laugh, uh, John, this is uh, great, because uh, John has all the genealogy of, uh, of the Healy's, and uh, uh, I didn't really know that much about the Healy. I knew my grandmother was a Healy, and uh, I remember, I don't want to get off track here because Neil will fire me. Uh, but I was in the FBI for about five years, and uh, there's another e agent I worked with by the name of Patrick Healy. And we went to uh, Marabone, Kentucky to, to solve a bank robbery back in, I think it was 1970. And we were down in Marabone, Kentucky, and we were both like first office agents, and we didn't know anybody. Uh, we thought we were going down and do a neighborhood investigation and, you know, just go down for a day and come home. 
we got down to Maribone, uh, Kentucky, the bank, and the bank robbers were still in the woods. <laughs> so Healy and I, we don't know what we're doing, you know, it was like first off, I don't think either one of us ever made an arrest before. <laughs> and so we're driving around and we're kind of pumped up, the adrenaline's going like it used to be when we were playing football. So the adrenaline's going and we're driving around, we're stopping every car in town. It's a real small town, Maribone, Kentucky, not a big town. But all the other old ages, I guess they've been through it, and you know, they said, let's go get a cup of coffee, let's do this. So Healy and I, we went on and we said, well, we're gonna go out together for a little while. So we went out and we're driving around, I don't know, it must have been two o'clock in the morning or you know, somewhere around there. And we're out by this pole hall, I think it was the only place in town that was open at that time. And walking from around from the other side of the building is this guy that has money in his hand. And that was a clue. We, you know, <laughs> we weren't the brightest guys in the world, but I played for Rad too long. But this guy brought the buddy and, and, and Hilly and I, we put the lights on him, opened the doors, the guy puts his hands up. And we went over and arrested him. I don't know if we know how to put the handcuffs on, but we arrested him. And, uh, J. Edgar Hoover gave me $200 commendation for that, uh, for arresting him, and I always said my grandmother was a Healy, you know, and I'm <laughs> proud of Pat Healy for that. And Neil, I don't want to get too far off base here, but I want to, I want to thank you. He's my new press agent, Neil Rudell, and I'm really happy. I don't agree with everything he writes, though. I mean, you know, I like Neil a lot as a person, but I don't agree with everything he writes. I want to just get on. There's a few people that I would like to thank and, and Dan, I, I do want to thank you for coming, and I appreciate those kind remarks. And you were the favorite. That's the reason I went to Penn State. But uh, no, I, actually, to follow up on your story about Maryland, uh, Roland Aragoni was down in Maryland, and my uncle was an FBI agent in Maryland. And we went down, and we went out that weekend, and it was so sunny and nice there that uh, I came back up to Penn State the following weekend, and it's snowing, and I'm thinking there's a difference in weather here. <laughs> and uh, this is not a bad campus, and they actually introduced us, had a little party in Maryland, and did things differently down there. <laughs> but I think my heart was always at Penn State. And when Paterno came that night, we did go out to the, there was only one good supper club in town. It was a Greenwood Supper Club, so there weren't too many choices, you know, where to go eat. But we went, and uh, uh, Paterno, I think I, I always wanted to go to Penn State, and I don't know, it was one of those whims for a weekend I decided to, you know, to come back to Penn State. But, uh, and I'm glad I did, it's, uh, it's great. Uh, just a couple comments, because I know I'm not gonna stay up here too long. Uh, <laughs> nobody wants me to stay up here too long. First of all, it is an honor for me because my uh, father was inducted and we're the first father and, and son team. And I think my father is here tonight. His silhouette is, you know, on the, the banister up there. And I know he's listening to us. He passed away two years ago, it'll be two years ago, uh, next Saturday night. Uh, but I feel like he's listening to us because my mother's wearing his hearing aid. <laughs> we always accuse mom, she doesn't uh, hear too well. She refuses to get a hearing aid, but she has a hearing aid, Bob, so I know he's listening tonight, you know. But it's, on a serious note, I think, you know, I would like to thank my other family members. Uh, Mom does have, you know, an inner strength, and I think a devotion of, I, your Cadillacs goes to cathedral about every day of the week to 12-5 mass, but she really is the heart and soul of our family, and I'm really proud to have a mother like my mom, and she's 85 and 
We hope she lives, stays with us, you know, a lot longer. Uh, my wife, Gail, she, uh, my daughter tells me I couldn't go out the door without her. <laughs> she is really, and I think she's right. <laughs> I got my th three children over there, Brian, Eric, and Kelly. Uh, Kelly was the Blair County Scholarship winner in 95. They're all district tennis champs. They've been excellent students, and I'm proud of all three. Kids, thanks for your support, and we're happy for you. Uh, my, is that what I wanted to say, or is it <laughs> what it came out? Uh, how, how much time do I have, David? <laughs> there are just a couple more comments. I thank my brother, Tom. I mean, he's been an inspiration to me all my life. My two sisters came in for this affair, Judy and Mary Beth, and I'm glad that you can make it. Healy introduced all the other relatives. Uh, there are a couple coaches here that I would like to mention. Uh, first, Bob Lozenak was my first basketball coach when I was a little league, and he's now the double-A owner. I'm glad he's here. Uh, John Heider is here, and I'll tell you, I, I think without John, I'm not sure I would have gone to Penn State or made it that far because he came in and, and set up a new offense, an open offense, and, and really helped us. And John, I appreciate all the efforts you did. You were a great high school coach. Uh, and Rip Engel, I was uh, thankful for Rip Engel, and I just remember a couple things about Rip. He always, uh, he was a real class person. And his comment was always, you guys are just this far from being great. You're just this far from being great, and we believed him. And last, <laughs> regardless of what Radakovich says, we know. <laughs> and then finally, I'd like to thank Joe Paterno, my last and most famous coach. Uh, my senior year at Penn State was uh, Joe's first as head coach, and I'm proud to be associated with such a legend. I just, there's a lot of people out there I would like to thank. I mean, a lot of you have supported me, and this has really meant a lot to me over the last year. I'm really honored by this, and I thank all of you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. You know, I just don't think I'll ever feel the same about the FBI ever again. <laughs> I know I feel better about it now that you're out. <laughs> I want to add something. You know, Mike talks about playing at Penn State and being on Joe Paterno's team. You should know that Mike was the captain of that Penn State team. Joe Paterno's first as head coach. He just didn't play there. He was the captain. And Mike, we've received a letter, and with your permission, I'd like to read it to you. Dear Mike, I'm really sorry I cannot be at the banquet tonight to be a part of your induction into the Blair County Hall of Fame. It hardly seems possible that it has been 30 years since you were one of the captains of my first team, and even longer than that since I had to fight off a Maryland recruiter in the parking lot of Bishop Guilfoyle High School. You were a great guy to coach and to have as a friend. You certainly deserve the honor you are receiving tonight. Again, I apologize that because of the pressure of spring practice, I cannot be with you. Have a great night, and again, congratulations. Sincerely, Joe Paterno. And Rad, I mean, I understand owning 12 houses, you might pick the wrong one, but what about the four kids? I mean, <laughs> sitting there. Lisa, I should warn you that Rad is now coaching with Joe Walton and Robert Morris, so he's, he's in the area. So <laughs> if your four kids are sitting around the, you know, the dinner table one night, you'll know who it is. Mike mentioned his father, not too kindly, I might add, but he mentioned his father. And, brought to mind that my dad, who was a tremendous sports fan, he and I, when I was a kid, 
used to argue about sports all the time. Who was best and what era and so on and so forth. And of course the answer is always generational. The people that he grew up with uh, remained his favorites. The guys that I used to watch in college and pro sports I thought were the best. Joe Lewis, Muhammad Ali, he loved Joe DiMaggio and I, Ted Williams was a favorite of mine and so on and so forth. And we have some kids who work at Fox Sports Pittsburgh, just out of college, just starting out in television, and they're big sports fans. They're producers, directors, cameramen, editors, and they're in their early to mid-20s. And I hear them start talking about Allen Iverson and Kenny Anderson, the great point guards. And God help me, I sounded just like my father and said, you punks don't know what you're talking about. Because the best point guard in history is sitting right here with us tonight. <laughs> Would you like some stats? Seventh leading scorer in the history of the NBA. Fourth in assists in the history of the NBA. And you watch these bucket heads on ESPN every night just screaming at you for one hour constantly trying to put on a show, and a player in the NBA gets a triple-double, points, rebounds, assists, and they're screaming like it's the second coming. Oscar Robertson, in the 1961-62 NBA season, averaged a triple-double for the entire year. Every, for the whole year, averaged out points, assists, and rebounds for a guard. Double figures and rebounds for a guard. And he wasn't like, thankfully, like Latrell Sprewell or Magic Johnson. Those guys are 6'7", six, 6'8". Six, he was 6'5". He was a big man for that position back then, taking guys to the hole all the time. Couldn't match up against him. And a point guard, he scored average 30 points a game. Average double-figure rebounds and assists. How much money, Oscar, would you make today? Oh, man. I bet you thought that once or twice yourself. <laughs> Inducted into the National Basketball Association Hall of Fame, obviously in 1979. Last year, you might remember, the NBA put out the top 50 players of all time, and of course, Oscar was on that. But you know what? If they had had a top 10 of all time, he'd have been on that, too. I can't tell you what a great thrill personally it is for me and here to present Jim Curry, the big O, Oscar Robertson. Thank you, Stan. You no, know, I was not like Spreewell. I didn't choke my coach. He was, he was much bigger than I was. And to Mike, this in jest, Mike, I think you're the reason they stopped having players play both ways in football. <laughs> That's a little joke. <laughs> but I want to congratulate all the inductees as Mike did and say you're very special tonight. It's a special occasion for all of you. I'm very honored to be here, be here for this celebration. To celebrate these great athletes being honored and to share the celebration with the entire community. Because you're the community that's worked very hard to say thanks to all these athletes. Because the people who support the hall, not only with their money, but with their effort and the volunteering their time to make sure that everything works successfully. And sometimes your work goes unnoted. But I'm here tonight to present my friend Jim Curry. I met Jim Curry when he came to, to the University of Cincinnati. I saw him grow from the early days at the University of Cincinnati to a young man, and I'm very happy about that. I'm very glad to include Jim into our Cincinnati family as well, because there's a man here tonight named Austin Tillotson. When I came to the University of Cincinnati, he got me involved, got me baptized in the church. And when Jim and all the other guys came, did the same thing with them also. Very stern person. He's small in small stature, but <laughs> carries a big stick. <laughs> Talking to Jim's sister, she said that Jim was, I said, what kind of athlete was Jim? She said, Jim was a natural. 
And looking, thinking back on that conversation with her and the times I had an opportunity to work out with Jim in the summers, Jim was a tremendous basketball player as well. And I've often wondered why he never played football, but I mean basketball, but maybe he'll, he'll go into that with you. But in the summers and playing basketball, we did a lot of practice in and around Cincinnati, unlike the players are today, because they're making so much money, I don't guess they really have time to practice. <laughs> <laughs> but being a natural football player, Jim could pass, run, true leader, and he had the size to be a, for a great football player. Also, as a basketball player, I know myself, he was a very great basketball player, played with a lot of style and flair. And not only that, Jim was a, a tremendous team player in both sports. And just seeing Jim coming here to be inducted is, is very special to him. See, I, I emotionally is about it. I'm glad that his family is here to see him be being inducted into this Hall of Fame as well. It's been said that Jim uh, is one of Altoona's finest all-around athletes, was a star performer on the hardwood as well as on the gridiron, earned all state honors in football, and was a two-time MVP at the Cambria County War Memorial Tournament. I'm very glad, glad that Blair County has inducted my brother Jim Carey into the Hall of Fame. Because to me, Jim Carey is the greatest athlete to ever play here in Altoona. And I'm very happy I'm able to come here. And he did something for me, which I'll share with you. But uh, <clears throat> recently, I underwent a little operation for my daughter. I gave her a kidney. And Jim Curry was there at 5.30 in the morning when I went into my operation. I give you now the greatest athlete <laughs> in Altoona Bath Sports, Mr. Jim Curry. Altoona, Pennsylvania. <laughs> I brought a few notes with me because I, some things I want to say and I want to say them as properly as I know how. Uh, it's a very emotional moment for me to have my family and friends here, my relatives, my beautiful wife, and my lovely daughter. Of course, Brother Weatherspoon, who has been just a super person, has just taken us from stem to stern, uh, just, just taking care of every whim that we, we might have had or needed, or before we could even think it, he took care of it for us. So a very special thank you, Brother Weatherspoon. <laughs> First, giving honor to God, who in I live, I move, and I have my being. And my prayer is the function in the center of his perfect will. To my deceased mother, Olive Curry, through whose womb I came, bringing the capacity to, for unconditional love and trust, to Austin and Gladys Tillotson. Gladys is no longer with us, but Oscar mentioned our Cincinnati father, Austin Tillotson. Please stand for me. He, he is the greatest man that I know, um, not just for me, but for many uh, young men that came to Cincinnati, maybe homeless, maybe lonely, maybe hungry, maybe needing counsel or advice. His home was always open to all of us. Oscar was his first child, gold medal winner. George Wilson was his second child. Gold medal, gold medal winner, and I was his third child, who he made just pure gold. <laughs> to Oscar Robertson, my presenter, who gave me my first pair of Stacy Adams shoes, my first set of golf clubs with big O stamped on them, <laughs> and the first elbow to my head. <laughs> he's been like a big brother to me, too. He's been very inspirational. Needless to say, he's some kind of a model to look up to and to try to emulate. Not only that, he's a great, great father. 
He's obviously a great athlete, and foremost, he's a great man. So to Oscar, I thank you for taking the time, the effort, and the energy to come to this wonderful paradise, which I consider Altoona, and, uh, and, and be my presenter. Oftentimes, as I move about in Cincinnati and other places, and they find out where I'm from, Altoona, they say, Altoona, where in the world is Altoona? And I said, the only reason why you don't know out where Altoona is is because you've never been to paradise. This has got to be the prettiest place that I have ever been. I mean, it's just absolutely beautiful, and you all are blessed. It's got to be God's little acre right here in Altoona. To my sister, June. To my sister, June, my brother, Calvin, who couldn't be here because he's now paralyzed and one of the very great, great athletes. Uh, that came out of Altoona and would have been even greater had he not had some tragedy in his early years. Um, six foot four, 225 pounds, a waist, you know, uh, 32 inches, something like Jim Brown, uh, could run like the wind, but had some unfortunate circumstances and didn't get a chance to go to high school. But I just wish that I could have had the ability that Calvin had. I mean, he was one great athlete and a real handsome, handsome Man, I always, I always envy my big brother. Um, uh, and my family, the rest of my family too, who, who gave me love and protection as I grew up uh, in Cincinnati uh, in Altoona. Excuse me, I've been in Cincinnati so long, so you have to pod, pardon me. Grew up, grew up in Altoona with the many times I was either fighting with them or fighting for them. But, uh, you know, I love them all. I have a large family. Uh, June, the oldest, Eileen, Calvin, Emma, Twala, Virginia, and cousin Bobby, who's here tonight. Bobby, stand for me. Boy, we did many. We, he, he, he made me tough. That's the fellow who we used to fight with all the time. And he made sure that I was tough. So I thank you for that, cousin Bobby. To my lovely wife, Janice, and my beautiful daughter, Raven. Stand for a sweetheart. They often confuse her, my wife, as being my daughter. They confuse my wife as being her sister. But that is my daughter and that is my wife. And I am very, very blessed. They are the reason that I live. And to my son, my deceased son, Shane, who now is with Jesus, I dedicate this even to him. Um, I, after his death, we established a foundation for Shane because he loved children so much. I won't go into a long dissertation on it, but I do just want to share with you the mission statement. Uh, and I think you understand who and what I am and who and what he, he was and what I stand for and what he stood for. Uh, we have a soccer team of, a uh, soccer league now, of 308 children from the ages of three to five years old that carries the name Shane's Kids. Um, they're Head Start kids, so most of them are underprivileged. But we have the opportunity to, to give them the very kinds of beautiful in inspiration, incentives, when they're very young so that they'll grow straight and they'll grow tall and they'll grow true. And our mission statement is the purpose of the foundation is to instill in our children a God-conscious sense of self-esteem and universal love, understanding that that life is precious, full of hope, promise, and unlimited possibilities. We want our children to know that they are fearfully and wonderfully, wonderfully made in God's image and likeness. And, unique, and uniquely designed for a particular purpose in God's eternal plan. We believe that through the help of religious leaders, teachers, coaches, business persons, and community leaders, we can transplant God's heart in our children.
Um, I did ask for special permission to be perhaps a little bit longer, but I feel pretty good because I'm doing pretty good. Um, but there are some people in, 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 uh, in Altoona that um, epitomized the very thing that I just read, that had, had a concern for children and um, inspired them and helped them and coached and, and uh, influenced them in very positive kinds of ways. And me in particular, as I think back to some of the people that were instrumental in, in my development, and I believe good character. And one of the gentlemen was Mr. Robert Clark. And from a very young child, my first experience with Bob Clark is he sponsored a, a basketball team. And we played at the YMCA. And I guess I was 9 or 10 years old, real, real small. And we lost the game, and I start crying. And Bob come up and put his arm around me and said, you know, he says, you're crying now. He says, but before it's over, you'll have many other folks crying, Jim. And he was that kind of an inspirational person. Person. He oftentimes sent me to the dentist to make sure that my teeth were strong and straight. He bought me clothes. He just did all kinds of wonderful things, not just for me, but for many others as well. But Bob is very special in my heart. And I do have a, a, a plaque that I want to leave with you tonight. We won't present it now, but uh, I talked to one of Bob's relatives, and you know Bob is no longer with us, but um, they'll receive it for, for him. Um, the second person is John Brannick, who was my junior high football coach, who for, for some strange reason found it necessary to make me a quarterback. And you know, I was, even at that time in ninth grade, I was probably six foot two, long and lanky, and he says, that don't matter, you got big hands. He says, and you're going to be a fine quarterback, Jim. And so he worked with me, you know, and in those days there weren't that many quarterbacks of color. So I think John stepped out on something special and, and worked with me. And so I, I, I thank, God knows I thank uh, John Brannick for that. He gave me the heart of a quarterback. And you can talk about any other sport, you can talk about any other position, but there's something special about a quarterback. There's Herky Bitar. I know Herky's here. Uh, really handsome. I had no idea he would preserve himself so well. <laughs> he, he was always worried about if I got to bed on time and if I learned how to do all the moves that Oscar Robertson did. I mean, he spent hours after practice showing me how to be like Oscar. I said, I'm already like Oscar. I'm as tall as Oscar. I'm the color of Oscar. So what else is there? <laughs> But I appreciate Herky for the many, many hours he shared with me and, and just was, was really my friend, him and his, his whole family. And Johnny Bitar, uh, I have a special plaque for him. Um, he had a restaurant here in the city. and He always made sure that Jim Curry ate well. And before every game, he would come in the locker room and take alcohol and rub down my thighs and my back and my shoulders. And at halftime, he would come and do the same thing. You know, and that's special, and that's, there's, there's a humble uh, preciousness about that that just defies description. And so, Johnny Bitar, I know you're not here tonight, but, you know, God knows I'm thinking about you. Um, Jim O'Donnell, who was my coach in basketball, you know, he wouldn't even let me go home after the games. He took me home. But before he would take me home, he would take me by a restaurant and make sure that I had a nice meal before he... And then he, him and his son, and then they would take me home. He wanted to make sure I didn't get in trouble. And he may, wanted to make sure I didn't have any bad influence. I always thought he just liked me and wanted to feed me. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, Earl Strom, who was, the, his, it was my high school football coach. And, you know, uh, just a, you know, everybody knows Earl Strom was just a real special man. And, uh, you know, he let me play quarterback. And he let me call the plays. And there were times when he said, Jim, what do you think we should do? And I says, well. It was a real critical situation. I said, well, you ought to let me fake the Geechee Gutshaw and then run the other way. <laughs> and it never failed. I mean, you know, Bob Gutshaw, as you, know, as you all know, was a great uh, halfback here in, in, in Altoona and had some tragedy at, at, um, in his college career. And consequently, he didn't go as far as he would have. But Geechee's always been very special to me. And if Geechee, you can hear me, God bless you. 
uh, there was June and Bill Moore, of course, my sister and her husband. And, uh, you know, I'd already told you how special they are to me. And, and she's been like a mother, and, and he's been like a, a brother more than a father. And he always had a million jokes to tell you, but he, he, was, a, he was a professional boxer and a real inspiration to me. And, of course, my brother Calvin, I told you about him, what a great athlete he was and, and the unfortunate circumstances befell him. So I have uh, some plaques for, for these folk, and, and hopefully uh, somebody, either them or those afterwards, will come up. It's just a picture of me. That's also no big deal. And, <laughs> Uh, it's, it shows me in some of my exploits, but, but I felt it's real important that I could share this moment with the people who helped make me whatever it is I might be. You know, they deserve this evening as well as I do, because, you know, it's, it's the character, the, the, the building of a character is done by the environment in which it finds itself and grows in. So if, if we up here are anything special, it's because of the people that have made us that way. You know, God has given us the physical ability, so we, God should be in, in the Hall of Fame. But surely, the people that has made us what we are, and that includes all of you because you supported us and you showed us love and concern. And uh, so, you know, this, this, this is your night as well. So, um, as my sister, June, always says, it doesn't matter who gets the credit as long as God gets the glory. So Altoona, this is your son, <laughs> whom I pray you are well pleased. And to God be the glory. What an elegant man you are, if I may say so. Now, like they said in The Wizard of Oz, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Because we're going to be setting up for Mary Lou's presentation, so disregard that. We have a number of people we'd like to recognize in the audience, and we would ask them to stand as well and, and ask you to welcome them. This gentleman led Williamsburg to the girls' 1997 PIAA basketball championship, Jeff Appleman. Jeff? This lady has led the St. Francis women's basketball team to three straight NCAA tournament appearances, Jenny Prezequis. Jenny? You may uh, recognize the name. This lady is the youngest coach in the NCAA. She coaches George Mason, and she's got a relationship with one of the members on the dais. Welcome, Debbie Tannehill. We got a brother act working here. First of all, older brother, has had an outstanding career as a wide receiver at Penn State. Still has time to play there and do great things. From Bedford County, Penn State wideout Joe Nastasi. Joe? <laughs> and his little brother. I don't know how little he is this year. He broke the state of Pennsylvania's all-time scoring record in basketball, breaking the record of Tom McMillan, who played at Maryland and later starred in the United States Congress. Not bad credentials. However, for some unknown reason, he likes football. And he's going to play football at West Virginia beginning this coming fall. A.J. Nastasi. A.J.? <laughs> What happened to you? You forgot to pay the electric bill? The spotlights are out? Oh, okay. I just wondered. You must be very proud of this gentleman. Jim mentioned Earl Strom and great football that was played here during those years. Under his leadership, Altoona High School football enjoyed its first undefeated regular season in 30 years. The head football coach at Altoona High, Ed Dalton. Ed?
My hats are off to all you people out here. You know, we've been trying to build a baseball stadium in Pittsburgh for a very long time, and it didn't seem to take you any. And because you're going to have one, that means you're going to have a real, live, professional baseball team in Class AA. Meet the owner of your new minor league baseball team, Bob Lozenak. Bob? And after watching the Pirates lose six straight, Bob, I got some people I think you could probably use. <laughs> and lastly, what a job this man has done. He came in under very difficult circumstances, really at the last minute. It's always difficult for an assistant to take over when the head coach leaves suddenly. And all he's done is come within one game of winning the NIT championship this year at Madison Square Garden. The head basketball coach at Penn State University, Jerry Dunn. Are we ready? Okay. Time for the main event. One of the things that's happened to us in this country is that we have become too quick to choose our heroes. We jump at them too quickly, and too many times we become disappointed. But not in this case. Athletes who play professional basketball, football, hockey, baseball, college, there's always a game tomorrow or next week where they can make up. If they don't perform well, they've got a chance to make it up. But when you're an Olympic athlete, you have one chance every four years, and most likely, in most cases, you have one chance your entire life to perform after years of training. And you have to remember what 1984 was like. We boycotted the Olympics in 1980. The communist bloc countries boycotted the Olympics in 1984. And the 84 Olympics were held in Los Angeles in our country. We had to win. We had to win to justify our boycott in 1980 and to show the rest of the world that we were right. And that communist Russia, which it still was then, was not. And so the pressure on the athletes was just tremendous because there was more there at stake than just gold medals. And if you will, just for a moment, let's go back to the summer of 1984. After two rotations, Akaterina Sabo leads Mary Lou Retton by 15 hundredths of a point the exact margin by which she trailed when the evening began. The third apparatus for Zabo is the vault. She scores a 9.9. Meanwhile, at the floor exercise, Mary Lou Retton is magnificent.
Sabo's final score has now been determined. If Rattan scores a perfect 10 in the ball, the gold medal is hers. If she gets a 9.95, she and Ekaterina Zabo will share the gold medal. If Rattan scores anything less than a 9.95, the gold medal will belong to Zabo. You know what means high, okay, going flat to me. Yes, feel that it's good. It's everything all right now, all right? Okay. Very good. Never better, okay? The best, the best of you can do, all right? I want to see you now. No more never, okay? Ladies and gentlemen, may I present not just an Olympic champion, but a true American hero, Mary Lou Retton. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, wow. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Wow. Thank you. Golly. It's such a warm welcome. Thank you very much. You know, Neil, I just met you tonight, but I feel like I need to crack a joke about you. <laughs> I don't know. I don't, a quick learner, huh? What a pleasure it is for me to be here this evening. For one thing, folks, it gives me a chance to get up here and dispel a long-standing rumor about myself. Can we please put to rest the rumor that I sleep with a smile on my face? <laughs> Truth of the matter is, and you parents out there know, I have a three-year-old and a one-year-old. I hardly sleep at all anymore. <laughs> you know, people always ask me if I ever get tired of watching that video you just saw. My honest answer, no. <laughs> well, let me explain. I, I really, I love watching it mainly for two reasons. Uh, the first being that it was probably one of the most incredible moments in my life. And second, when it's projected onto a large screen like this. <laughs> I'm so big. <sighs> Seriously, though, it, it truly is an honor for me to be here um, this evening. I'm particularly honored to be a part of um, tonight's induction and scholarship program because I'm a firm believer in both athletics and education. They're both very, very important to me. And I think what makes it especially nice for me is that I look out here this evening into the audience, and I see a group of people with winning attitudes. I mean, just this whole evening, I felt such a strong sense of warm family, local support. And, it, and I see it, and I feel it. Whether your involvement here tonight is as a corporate sponsor, who this evening wouldn't even be possible without, or if you're here as an inductee, or a scholarship recipient, or a member of a family, you guys are out there supporting one another. And that is so very important. You know, I have the opportunity to speak to all different groups across the country. And when I'm gathering my background information from my remarks, I find out a lot about an organization. And I find out a lot about people. You know what, folks? I've come to realize that it takes the same qualities to become a champion in any organization as it does to become a champion in sports. I mean, there's nothing magical or there's no secret formula to it. Just a tremendous amount of hard work, dedication, determination, and believing in yourself. I mean, for instance, in both sports and, and this organization, you, you've got to keep pace with the times. Now, for me, that meant introducing newer and more complex moves into my gymnastics routines. I mean, I had to. If I wanted to keep up with all of the changes that were happening in my sport, and keep ahead of my competition. Now, folks, to get there, it's never easy. 
But I didn't get to the Olympics and win the Olympics by taking it easy. And these people sitting up here at the dais didn't get inducted into the Blair County Sports Hall of Fame by taking it easy either. And the two young people out there didn't receive the student scholarships for taking it easy either. It takes a tremendous amount of initiative. It takes enthusiasm. But I think most of all, it takes a deep commitment to achieving success. Now, to reach that success, you have to rise to challenges. You must surpass goals, and you have to exceed expectations. And believe me, folks, I can relate to exceeding expectations. And I'm going to come around in front so I can get a little bit closer. What you all witnessed on that film wasn't supposed to happen. I mean, I wasn't supposed to be there, and I, I certainly wasn't supposed to do that. Because you see, gold medalists in gymnastics weren't supposed to come from America. American girls weren't supposed to come from West Virginia. Oh, well, they weren't. <laughs> <laughs> and after having knee surgery just six weeks earlier, I wasn't even supposed to be at the Olympics. Now to get there, I had to overcome a lot of limits which had been placed on me by history, by other people, and by myself. Now I grew up in a small coal mining town that had never sent anybody to the Olympics. I wasn't built the way gymnasts were supposed to be built. You know, very slender and graceful. I mean, my own coach, my own coach, Bella Carulli used to say about me, Muddy Luigi is not quite the butterfly. <laughs> And you know what, less than two years before the Olympics, I wasn't even a world-class gymnast. I was a little kid from West Virginia. People barely knew my name. Now to make it to that medal stand, I had to take risks. I had to seek out challenges and I had to recognize my own strengths, which were speed and power, and make them work for me. I had to learn to be resilient. But I think most importantly, in my case, I had to learn how to seize the moment. Now, any champion needs those qualities. I mean, they're not limited to just athletic champions. We all need them. Your actor, artist, politicians, businessmen and women, student athletes, Hall of Fame recipients. Anybody in this room who has a dream and wants to make that dream real? Well, my dream was to win a gold medal at the 1984 Olympics in Los Angeles. But if I hadn't taken a very big risk and left home, West Virginia, when I was just 14 years old, to move to Houston, Texas to train with the very famous Bella Caroli, it never would have happened. Now, folks, everything changed for me back in 1982. I was just at a national competition in Reno, Nevada. And I, Bella was there. And I guess he had been watching me throughout the competition because smack dab in the middle of it, of it he came up to me, tapped me on the shoulder, and I, Turned up and I looked up at him, you know, he's a big man, he's 6'3", 6'4". And here I was, looking up at the king of gymnastics, right, Bella Caroli, the man who had coached my gymnastics idol, Nadia Comaneci. So he said to me in his deep Hungarian accent, he said, Mary Lou, you come to me and I make you Olympic champion. <laughs> Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, turning around trying to figure out, you know, who's this man speaking to? Couldn't be me, but it was. Well, I didn't know Bella at all at the time, but I had seen his girls. And in the gymnastics community, we used to quote them as the Caroli kids because they were always so ready and so prepared. And you know, Bella was always right there at their side, you know, getting them hyped up and getting them psyched up to where they had no doubts about anything. And now Bella wanted me to come to Houston become one of them. Well, he sat down I mean, right there at the competition with my mother and father and said, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Retton, I can't guarantee, I can't guarantee your daughter will make the Olympic team. However, I think she's got the raw material, you know, that raw potential that it takes. Well, here is the chance of a lifetime for me. But there are all sorts of huge questions too. I mean, was I mature enough to handle being away on my own at the age of 14? You know, would I be able to manage money and, and do my schoolwork, deal with being homesick? 
Well, to say the least, a lot of different emotions were stirring up inside of me. I was confused. I was really scared. But I was excited all at the same time. I mean, Bella Coroli wanted to train me. But then I'd be leaving all my family and all my friends behind and entering into this strange and this new world where I didn't know a soul. I'd like to see a raise. Raise your hand if you're a parent. All right. Well, then you all can kind of try and understand how my parents felt. Think about it. Would you let your 14-year-old daughter move halfway across the country to train with a crazy Romanian who'd been in America less than two years? <laughs> Woo! Well, as I stand up here on this stage this evening as a mother of two small daughters, I can honestly say I don't know if I'd let my daughters do that. I really don't. But I've been truly blessed by the Lord with very loving and extremely supportive parents. So after this competition in Reno, we went back home to West Virginia and we discussed this whole situation over the Christmas holiday break. And the ultimate question to me from my mother and father was, I said, Mary Lou, okay, what do you want to do? And I told him, I said, Mom, Dad, I said, I don't want to spend the rest of my life thinking I could have gone to the Olympics if. And the truth of the matter was that if I had stayed in West Virginia, I never would have known. So I packed up everything I owned, and my parents drove me to Texas two days before the new year began. Folks, for me, it literally was like going off to see the Wizard of Oz. I mean, I was going from this small town in the hills to this huge city with skyscrapers and expressways. I was going to be living with a family I'd never met, training with girls I didn't know. <laughs> I was going to be working with a coach I couldn't even understand. Oh, I'm telling you, his accent was so thick for the first few months. You know, I was constantly asking my other teammates, you know, what did he say? What did he say? However, one word I quickly understood was no. You know, we'd finish a bar routine, for example, and we'd just mount off of the bar. We'd do our little finish, and I'd turn around to get Bella's critique, and every time for the first few months, you know, his head would be down, and the hand on his head, and he'd be shaking, no, 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 no. Oh, it used to infuriate me. I used to get so mad, think to myself, it was good in West Virginia. <laughs> <laughs> Tell you what, though, I soon realized that it, it wasn't good enough in Texas because Bella, I don't know, Bella made a strive towards perfection. Now, another big change for me from West Virginia to Texas was the actual workout load. Back home, I was used to doing maybe one or two routines on each of the different apparatus that we work out on in gymnastics, and I thought that was enough. Well, at Bella's, we had to do 10, 11, 12, sometimes 15 routines on each of the different events. And at Bella's, each one had to be perfect. I mean, like you were competing at the Olympic Games. One of his famous lines he used to use all the time, and I'm sure you coaches back here have used it before, one more, Mary Lou, just one more. <laughs> yeah, right. When Bella said that, you knew you were in the middle of workout. Because you see, in his gym, you could always be better, and you could always be more perfect. But you had to be. Now, in, in my sport, in gymnastics, they change the scoring values every four years after each Olympic Games. So what gets you a, a score of a perfect 10 at one Olympics is really considered routine at the next. So you see, you're always breaking new ground. And folks, this is a sport which is computed to the hundredth of a point. Now, when I beat Ekaterina Zabo of Romania at the Olympics, folks, I beat her by five hundredths of a point. Now, that's the smallest margin that you can beat somebody by. And that was after scoring perfect tens on my last two events. So you see in gymnastics, one tiny, just itsy, bitsy mistake can kill you. I mean, just, just a moment of sloppiness, you know, a, a misplaced hand on the bars or a, or a false step on the balance beam, or even just an extra half rotation in the air can mean disaster. And in gymnastics, <laughs> I take it from me, there is no place to hide and there are no soft landings. You know that balance beam we work on? Stupid event. I have no idea who ever invented the balance beam. I hated the beam. That beam that we work on stands about four, four feet off of the ground. Okay. 
and is only four inches wide. And the upper bar on the uneven parallel bars that we work on stands eight feet above the floor. So as I mentioned earlier, Bella really pushed us towards perfection. But you know what we pushed ourselves to? Now when I made the move to Houston, I made the move up against the number one gymnast in the whole state, in the, it's the whole state, the whole country. Her name was Diane Durham. She was number one in this whole country. Diane and I became really good, very fast friends. But we were after one another. You know, you know, Diane would go do a vault. Man, then I'd have to go do it better. And then she'd try and top me. It was back and forth of this every single day inside of Bella's gym. Well, after a few months of this very healthy and very competitive working out, we were both pretty even in Bella's because I had improved so fast under his coaching style and under his technique. But Diane had the name and a very well-deserved number one spot. So she and another one of our top gymnasts at that time, if you all uh, recall the name Julianne McNamara, is also a gold medalist and, and teammate of mine. Those two got invited to the 1983 American Cup, which is one of the world's biggest and most prestigious competitions in the world. Okay, all the major countries in the world send their best people to American Cup. And if you win it, man, everybody in the sport knows you. And I hate to admit it, but that helps you in gymnastics because it's, it's subjective like that, like that of figure skating where sometimes you know, your name and your reputation can help you get that higher score from the judges. Well, I'm only an alternate that year. Right? I'm a sub. I'm riding the pine. So, well, I was. So I figured I'd go sit in the stands in New York City's Madison Square Garden, shoot the breeze and watch everybody else. But the night before the event, literally the night before the event, Bella came to me and came into my hotel room and told me that Diane had pulled a muscle in her hip during the workout session, that she wasn't competing in the morning. I was. I don't know if you've got a feel for how intense my coach is from that very short videotape, but let me say he's a very intense coach. He sat me down in a chair, and he pulled one up himself. I'll never, I'll never forget the words he said to me. He said, Mary Lou, this is your chance. This is your chance. Don't let me down. Oh, <laughs> Well, I had never been in a big international meet in my life, you know, not against the Russians and the Romanians. Oh, man, if I thought about it, there were a lot of reasons for me to be nervous. But you know what? I soon realized that I had absolutely nothing to lose, right? I'm a last-minute substitute whom almost nobody knew or nobody expected anything from. If I messed up, who'd notice? Boy, but if I did well, if I did well, especially before a packed house in New York City's Madison Square Garden, it would open up a huge door for me. Well, I'm happy to say that everything did end up coming together for me on every gymnastics apparatus that weekend. I ended up beating Julianne and the Russian world champion for that American Cup title. And personally, that was my breakthrough. You know, I had seized the moment. Well, the next month, I wound up on the cover of International Gymnast Magazine, which is the Bible of our sport. The judges knew who I was now, and so did my competition. You know, I'd go to different meets throughout that year after winning the American Cup, and, and I'd sense the other girls, you know, watching me warm up and, and whispering behind my back and pointing, you know, hey, that's Mary Lou. She won American Cup. <laughs> I say it felt great. It did. It did wonders for my confidence. However, what I needed to do now, though, was to win another major event that was outside of my comfort zone. You people know about comfort zones because we all have them, and we spend most of our lives living in a comfort zone. You know, avoiding risks, avoiding the unknown, and avoiding the potential to fail. Why do we do that? Well, because it's real safe and it's real easy. But sometimes in order to get ahead, you know, in order to get the edge on your competition, man, you got to go outside of your comfort zone. So in my own personal story, and in my case, I traveled all the way to Tokyo, Japan for, again, one of the world's premier international competitions, the Chinichi Cup. Well, folks, a lot of things come into play when you're competing in a strange country. 
I mean, number one, a huge jet lag that I don't care what people say, your body never becomes accustomed to. Different food and water, a language you don't speak or read, and judges who have no reason whatsoever to favor you. But I overcame all those things to win the title at Shinichi Cup, and folks, when I did, that's when it really did unbelievable things for my confidence. Because you see, the people who can adjust to being outside of their comfort zone and still perform, those are the people that become champions. It's true in the athletic field. It, it's true in, in our work that we do every day at the office or wherever our work is. And it's equally true in our family lives at home. Now physically, physically, when this little body got back in the United States from Japan, mentally, I knew I was ready for the Olympics. But I still had six months more of two practices every day at Bella's. And I knew that if I slacked off just a little bit, <laughs> I wouldn't be the best in my own gym. Well, a couple months had passed, and workouts were going very good, very consistent. And consistency is something that's very, very important in gymnastics. We do repetition after repetition after repetition. So when you get into a competition, your body just takes over, and you do it again. That was my coach Bella's philosophy. So workouts were going very good, very consistent. But it was really odd. Diane Durham decided she didn't want Bella to train her anymore. So she left his program and went to get coached elsewhere. But at the same time, Julianne McNamara, who was living and training in California, decided she wanted Bella to coach her. So she made the move to Texas. So I was always very lucky. You know, I always had that top competitor to work out with every minute I was there. I mean, it literally was like having a national championship seven days a week. And that meant we had to be ready to go full speed the minute we walked inside of his gym. I want to see another raise of hands now, you guys. An honest raise of hands. I know you're sitting next to family and peers and friends and workmates or whoever. Maybe, now just raise your hand if you've ever felt this way, maybe one time in your life. You know, you hear the alarm go off in the morning, right? And it's 6.30 or it's 6, whatever time you get up, you're trying to feel for that snooze button, right? And hit that snoo snooze button. You kind of just maybe moaned yourself, oh, don't feel like going to work today. Oh, come on! No, thank you. Every hand should be up. Come on. All right. Thank you. That was an honest feeling. Every hand should be up in this room. At least one time in your life, I know you felt that way. Well, I certainly have. Boy, there were days when I didn't want to go. And gymnastics was my job. That was my job. There were days when I didn't want to go. A lot of days. I was sore all over that I could barely drag this little body out of bed. And I was so sick and tired of doing the same thing over and over that I could scream. But I made myself go anyway, just like we all do. You know, I showed up when I was sick, and I showed up when I was hurting. And if you're a gymnast, or you know a gymnast, <laughs> something's always hurting. Because you see, the equipment that we work out on, it's made of wood and fiberglass. You see, and our bodies are always banging up against the equipment, making contact with the equipment. I mean, I've bruised hips. I've broken ribs, I've separated shoulders, a broken wrist, uh, fingers and toes, a few concussions. Um, I <laughs> remember one time, this is such an embarrassing injury, but I'm going to share with you anyway. We're doing simple warm-up move on the uneven parallel bars, right? We hadn't even begun to get into our difficult things, our hard things. Well, if you've ever seen gymnastics in person or on television, before you actually see us get up onto the uneven bars, you always see us at this big bowl of white stuff, right? Putting the white stuff on our hands. Well, that's what we call chalk, kind of like a powdered form of what you write on the blackboard. Well, the chalk is supposed to give you a better grip on the bar, right? Prevent you from slipping off. Well, I don't know what my particular problem was in this very <laughs> simple case. I don't know if I didn't have enough chalk on my hands or what my problem was, but I completely slip off of the bar on this very easy move. And I land on the mat on my stomach with my head back like this. And you're probably thinking, oh my goodness, maybe a head or a neck or a back injury. No, thank the Lord, it, it wasn't that serious. Don't ask me how, but I somehow punctured or broke that little piece of, <laughs> little piece of skin between your lower lip and gum. This one, if you go like this, you feel it? <coughs> feel that piece? I hope you're enjoying that because I don't have it anymore. 
I really think that's why my smile is lopsided. My lip goes down because it holds your lip up. It really does. It looks like someone had taken a pencil and punctured a hole in my lip. Blood's coming out all over the place, and it, it hurt a lot. But I think it really hurt my pride even more because it was such a simple skill. But Bell's rule was you didn't complain. He used to tell us, you've got to be a strong athlete, not a scared, timid little rabbit. So with that in mind, when, when my right knee was hurting during the spring of 1984, right, Olympic year, I didn't think much about it because, you know, as an athlete, you work with a little bit of pain, and I certainly didn't complain about it. But one night after we did an exhibition at a summer camp that Bella was conducting in Louisville, Kentucky, I noticed something was really, really wrong. So I, I hobbled up to Bella, I tapped him on the hip, <laughs> and I said, Bella, I said, I said, my knee's locked. And he thought I was joking, and he started to laugh and walk away. He said, oh, Mary Lou, that's a good one, that's a good one. He started to walk away. Well, I knew in my heart that something was seriously wrong, so I was very persistent, and I, I grabbed him again. I said, Bella, I, said, I cannot straighten my knee. My knee's locked. He said he made some other joke or some other crack, and he, he said, go back to the hotel, sleep with ice on it, be here at 7 a.m. for workout in the morning. So I did as I was told and went back to the hotel that we were staying at, and thank goodness Julianne was with me, and she helped me get this huge ice pack, and I slept with that on my knee. Well, in the morning, the situation was much, much worse. Folks, my knee had grown to the size of this inflated balloon. So they rushed me to the emergency room there in Louisville, and the doctor was examining me, and he kind of just looked up from my knee and just said, you know, just like matter of fact, he said, little lady, we're going to have to do surgery right away. <laughs> surgery? This physician had no idea where this little person had just gotten back from. We had just gotten back from championships, the United States of America, first place. Two weeks earlier, we had arrived home from Olympic trials, first place. I'm going to the Olympics, right? A dream come true for me since I'm seven years old. And this doctor's telling me I have to have surgery? Well, he explained to me that I, I guess just over the years of wear and tear and, and pounding of my sport that my knee had had enough. A piece of cartilage had broken off and that piece had broken off into two pieces and one was lodged in my knee joint, which is why my knee was in that lock position, and the other was just floating around somewhere waiting to do damage. Now, even though it was a relatively easy operation to remove it, folks, I'd have less than six weeks to have surgery, rehabilitate the knee, and then try and get back into some kind of Olympic shape. Well, the doctors ver weren't very optimistic about my chances. They were honest with me. Some said, no way. They said, Mary Lou, you need six weeks just to rehab your knee, let alone start tumbling and landing on it. I mean, it's true. When you think of us doing the vault or the floor exercise, you know, we're tumbling. We're getting 10, 12 feet up in the air. We're coming down on our legs. I'll never forget one doctor, he told me to go back home to West Virginia and just wait until the next Olympics. <laughs> At that moment, precisely, something inside of me surged and moved and twisted, whatever you want to call it. And I said, nobody was going to tell me what I could or couldn't do or even try, right? I'd made it this far. Nobody was going to put a limit on me. So I mean literally, I had surgery right away, and I was barely out of recovery. I don't even remember the plane ride back to Houston when they put me on a plane back to Houston. The next day, I was back in the gym, putting myself through probably one of the most difficult times in my life. Does everybody know who John Madden is? Everybody, I love John Madden. He's my favorite. John Madden has said he's a very colorful football analyst on Fox. John Madden says, the road to Easy Street goes through the sewer. <laughs> that's great, that's so John Madden. I love that, folks, because you know what? He's right. Well, in my case, it was. I mean, talk about frustration. One day before, I was in the best shape of my life, and now I'm learning to walk again. 
Well, I became a maniac. You know, if the doctors told me to do 20 leg lifts to rehab my knee, I'd do 100. I swam, I rode an exercise bike, I did everything I could possibly do on all of the gymnastics apparatus that didn't involve tumbling or landing. And I did about three months worth of rehabilitation in about two and a half weeks. By the beginning of July, I was back to two-a-day workouts. And when we arrived in Los Angeles for the 1984 Summer Olympic Games, I was completely ready. And nobody, and we wanted it this way, nobody but Bella, the doctors, and my parents knew I even had surgery. Now, for some athletes, just getting to those Olympics is enough, right? I mean, they've beaten these tremendous odds by just making the team. Anything more is gravy. But Bella never let us think that way. I mean, his kids never said, if we make the Olympic team, we always said, when. So Julianne and I, we didn't spend much time roaming around the Olympic Village, you know, shopping and sightseeing and having fun. We worked out twice a day. Once in the morning time with Bella in a private session, and then once in the evening with the rest of our American team. Now, even though gymnastics seems like an individual sport, because you always see us up there on the apparatus by ourselves, folks, it's very much of a team sport. And you compete by team, usually placing your weakest girl up first on each apparatus, and then you save your best for last, kind of like your cleanup batter in baseball. But your first girl has an extremely important job because she establishes that scoring base that's going to affect your last one. Let me give you an example. Let's say, let's say your first girl gets up on the balance beam and she scores a 9.1. Well, it's not likely to happen, or it's very rare if it does, that your last girl is going to get a 10 even if she does a perfect routine. You see, the first one has to perform well enough to score around a 9.5 so you can build your way up to that 10. So you see, a strong team helps everybody individually. I know when I think of the word team, I think of it as an acronym. With T standing for together, E, everyone, A, achieves, M, more. So together, everyone achieves more. But really, I guess in the end, you know, you're there on that beam, you're up there on that vault by yourself. And see, once we get the green light from the judge, we can't affect the other people we're competing against. You see, gymnastics, gymnastics it's, not like, it's not like football or basketball, right? Where you know you can tackle your opponent, or they can try and block a shot. Or it's not a contact sport like figure skating, where you can whack somebody over the knee with a hammer. <laughs> 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 That's bad. It's illegal. I mean, when Ekaterina Zavo was at the Olympics and she got a 10 on her beam routine, I couldn't go up there and push her off. Right? It's against the rules. So all I could do was the best I could do when my moment came. I mean, let's take the floor exercise as an example for me. Now, I know never in my life, even to this day, would I be able to get out onto the floor mat and do a routine to, to I don't know, violin music with all these ballet moves? That's not me. So I did mine in the air with lots of tumbling and lots of energy. I used my strengths, and it scored me a 10. But I still needed a break to become Olympic champion. I did. It was a little break from the Lord. All it was was watch my feet. One tiny step backwards by Zabo at the end of her bars routine. Right? It wasn't much. It cost her like one-tenth of a point. Boy, but it gave me that sliver of daylight I needed. It was time again for me to seize the moment. Now, if I scored a 9.95 on the vault, I could share the gold medal with Zabo. If I scored a perfect 10, I could win it alone. <laughs> well, I didn't want to share anything. I didn't, and I knew I could get that 10. I knew I could. 
So I'm standing down there at the end of the runway. At exactly my starting point was 73.5 feet. That was, my, that was where I started my vault run. And I was waiting for the green light from the judge. And Barrow always taught us to treat each competition the same, whether it was a, a local, a regional, a national, international, world championships, Olympics, whatever the competition, you treat it with seriousness. And also as a competitor, I don't know if you've noticed, but I'm a pretty hyper person, high energy. And during, co during competitions, I'd even get more. You know, the butterflies were going, the adrenaline was pumping. So as a competitor, I would talk to myself constantly throughout the, the competition. So I'm back there going, OK, Mary Lou, breathe, relax, stay loose. It's no big deal. It's just any other ordinary meat. It's just like regionals. It's no big deal. As I'm trying to convince myself of this, waiting for the green light, there was this tiny little voice in the back of my head screaming at me, you dummy. You dummy, this isn't any other ordinary meat. This is the Olympics. I mean, this was it. My ultimate moment of truth. Everything I had dreamed about and worked towards and sacrificed over the past nine years was on the line. That Olympic title, that gold medal, and a chance to do something that no other American had ever done before. All those things are standing through my, going through my head as I'm standing there to vault. <laughs> Talk about pressure. Let me try to put it into perspective the type of pressure I was under. Let's say that you all, you're at work, right? And you've been working on one project for the past nine years, OK? And you need to make one more decision in order to make this project complete. If you make the right decision, the project is a huge success, right? And you've realized your lifelong dream. If you make the wrong decision, it's a failure. You have no second chance, baby. It's now or never. Oh, and also, I forgot to add, also, by the way, when you're at your desk or in your office trying to make this very important decision, there are 16,000 people in your office watching you <laughs> make this important decision. And, and you're aware that there are millions, no, billions of people on television watching you make this important decision. I mean, consider this, right? The World Series, baseball's most glamorous event. Last year's World Series was viewed by 200 million TV viewers. That's a lot of people. The Super Bowl, right? The biggest football game in the world. Last year's Super Bowl game was viewed by 750 million people. Now, as big and as, as glamorous as those events are, folks, they don't hold a candle to the Olympics. The 1996 Summer Olympic Games that we all watched in Atlanta was viewed by 33 billion cumulative viewers over the 16-day period. That's how big the Olympics are. And according to NBC, they say that 90% of the world's population watched the Olympics at one time or another. Isn't that amazing? That's how big the Olympics are. And that's kind of sort of the pressure that I was under. But you know what, folks? You can think pressure, or you can think no pressure. I knew I could do the vault. And I knew I could do a 10, because I'd done it before. All I had to do was what I had done a 1,000 times in Bella's gym, that vault. And I think the reason that I could do it at the Olympics was because I had practiced it and I had trained it a thousand times. And that's why even after I stuck the first one for the 10, I went and I did it again. And the rules really said I didn't have to, but gosh, I wanted to. Because I always believed in giving more than you had to, you know, giving that little bit extra. And I wanted to prove that you can do extraordinary things if you rise above your limits, both real and imaginary. I mean, we can always find reasons why some things can't happen. In athletics, in our work, at our family lives at home. And what you all witnessed on this film just a few minutes ago wasn't supposed to happen. But I've got a gold medal at home that says it did. You can always avoid taking the risks and, and meeting the challenges because those are the things that are dangerous to your comfort zones. But folks, taking those risks and meeting those challenges head on and not being afraid of them and not being afraid to fail because we can learn so much from our failures. Sometimes that's the only way to make your dreams come true. It certainly was in my case. That is my personal story of what it took for me to stand on that metal stand in my life. And I, 
want to take this opportunity to congratulate all the inductees. Congratulations to each and every one of you, the scholarship recipients. You have been a tremendous audience, and thank you for having me. Thank you, Mary Lou. In conclusion, I want to offer congratulations to all up here on the dais, and I would ask you just for one last round of applause for our inductees and scholarship winners tonight. Our congratulations to all of our inductees and our scholarship winners. Our thanks to the presenters. You all did magnificent, wonderful jobs. But most of all, thanks to you for coming event after event. Without your support, none of us would be here. Again, thank you for coming. We'll see you next time. Good night. Congratulations. Congratulations.